ask you, if you will, to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Very familiar passage of Scripture this time of year. Let me be among the first. I know I'm not probably the first one, but let me be among the first to offer you a season's greeting of Merry Christmas. Amen. Boy, it's, it feels good to say that even, so very thankful for it. I want to look, if you will, at Luke chapter 1. We will begin to read in verse 26. We will read here the very first Christmas uh, season greeting of uh, Merry Christmas to the world. Here in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, greetings, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. The very first Christmas greeting, that of Gabriel to Mary, uh, he said, Hail, or greeting, very cheerful greeting, thou that are highly favored, and that word literally means you who are richly graced. Favored there is the same word, it comes from the same kind of root word that we get the word grace from. Thou art highly graced uh, before God. One Bible teacher I was uh, reading during my preparation this week suggested that we could refer to this holiday holiday as Gracemas. Merry Gracemas, amen? Because truly it is certainly the ultimate demonstration of grace to a desperate world. God not only gave us his only begotten son at this time of year, but at Christ's expense, the Father has also given us wonderful riches which, uh, with which to face the stressors of life. And this season has a lot of stressors involved in it, and we need a lot of grace this time of year. And God's riches are here. Because, Christ, because of Christ, we can know love, faith, hope, and peace, to name just a few of his bountiful graces and riches that he gives to us. Many people, though, sadly, many from within the ranks of the church-going believers, become so overwrought during the days leading up to December 25th that they adopt a mascot and this becomes their mascot. We know this fellow. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Don't ask me why. No one quite knows the reason. Maybe it's because his head wasn't screwed on right Maybe because his shoes were too tight. But pro probably most of all, most likely reason of all, may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. I'm going to put him down here. I had him down here before, but it's kind of ominous with him shadowing over the nativity scene. He's from the ACLU. He's ready to steal Christ away from Christmas. So... As, as I think about the Grinch, I was thinking about a woman I read about one day. Again, I was preparing for the message. She had had an exasperating day of Christmas shopping, searching for parking spaces in overflowing lots, pushing her way through mobs of rude fellow shoppers, rushing from store to store in an unsuccessful attempt to find that special item that was on someone's Christmas list. And finally, on her way home, trying to leave the store, she squeezed herself into a crowded elevator, trying to get home to a Christmas party that she was hosting on top of all of it. As the door slid shut, she said to no one in particular, whoever came up with this idea of Christmas ought to be, um, ought, ought to be taken out and shot. And from the back of the elevator, a voice responded and said, don't worry, lady, they already crucified him. Hmm. So we have a choice. We can either celebrate Gracemas or Grinchmas. I'm going to 
know, and I've seen, seen so many uh, T-shirts, sweatshirts, and different things advertising happy Grinchmen. But, you know, that ought not to be our attitude as Christians. Amen? We ought to be focusing on the grace of God at this time of year. Now, I, I get it. I mean, I understand that uh, this season has been over-commercialized. I understand that totally, and the promotion begins way too early. You know, uh, right after or during Halloween, they change all the displays out in the stores, and suddenly you've got Christmas trees instead of pumpkins, and, you know, they kind of jump all the way over Thanksgiving and throw us right into, into the Christmas season right away. And there are a lot of personal factors that dampen our festive spirit as well. But I want to appeal to you this year. Don't let the secular Grinches of the ACLU or the circumstantial Grinches of the holiday hullabaloo steal your Christmas joy away from you. You know, I wrote that out and then I thought, man, that rhymes. Don't let the secular Grinches of the ACLU or the circumstantial Grinches of the holiday hullabaloo steal your Christmas joy away from you. I could be the next Dr. Seuss, you know? Look for my book next season, all right? I want to, I want to challenge you through the series of messages to have a grace-filled holiday instead of a Grinch-foiled holiday. Let grace fill your holidays this time of year. So it's my plan to bring some messages during December that will deal with the several with several Grinch inducing attitudes, Grinches that steal our joy, and give you a counter grace, something that will help you to overcome the Grinch. Grace can overcome the Grinch in your holiday season if you will allow God to work in your heart and life. And the most wonderful grace that God presents to us, uh, I think, is the love of God that comes at this time of year. So I'm going to start with a very prominent, all-too-common Grinch of the holidays that many people suffer with and has stolen their joy, and that's the Grinch of loneliness. I want to talk to you about loneliness. Now, you may not be a lonely person, but surely you know someone who's lonely in your life. Loneliness is a painful experience in our world because God created us to be relational beings. God wired us that way. Back when they, 2020, when they started saying, you know, you need to, shelter in and you need to stay away from people, they were harming us because we were not wired to be isolated. God, God created us to have fellowship with one another. In the record of the week of creation found in Genesis 1 through, and chapters 1 and 2, we read repeatedly that God surveyed the works of his hands and pronounced them good. He created these things and after, after his day of creation, he'd step back and he'd say, it is good. The only thing that God saw in his new creation, which was not good, we find in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18, and that was that man should be alone. He looked and he saw that man was alone. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. And so he swiftly remedied that situation. He brought to man a help meet. But uh, after sin entered into our world, the problem of loneliness quickly resurfaced has been a constant blight in the world of mankind. God created man a help meet so that he would not be alone, and then man sinned, and you know what God, what man immediately did? He went and hid himself. He went and tried to isolate himself and stay away from, from the Lord. Even those that we think should be the most connected in our society are often those that struggle with the reality of loneliness. Albert Einstein, how many have ever heard of Albert Einstein? Well, even in his own day, not only was he world famous in his own lifetime, uh, but he was so well known wherever he went. But he made this statement. He said, it is strange to be known so universally and yet to be so lonely. One of the statements that I read, quotations I heard read about loneliness. In a world with over 8 billion people, it's amazing to know how many lonely people there are. I started looking up quotations of uh, loneliness during the Christmas season. And one I read just broke my heart. It came from an anonymous 60-year-old man who said this, Christmas guts me every year. 
I already accept that there will be no, there will not be even a phone call for me. It was sad. I read that and I thought, not even a phone call. This guy knows that he's just going to be so alone during the holiday season. And I thought, what a sad thing. You know, as we look around us, even though we have all of these new uh, devices to stay in contact with one another, we can do it through email, we can do it through text messaging, we can do it all kinds of ways to be instantly connected with others. And yet, even though you may have a Facebook page and have, I don't know, 500 people friend you, you still feel lonely because that's not real friendship. We, we were created for face-to-face -face connection with people. And so no kind of digital or uh, cyber sort of connection is going to replace that in our lives. Loneliness is a common fact in our world. Loneliness is a common fact. What is loneliness? Ask this question. What is it to be lonely? Well, let me tell you first of all what loneliness is not. Loneliness is not solitude or being alone. That can be good. You know, there are times I'm grateful for periods of solitude where I can escape from the demands and distractions of life and just concentrate on the Word of God and spend time with the Lord in prayer. I like solitude. In fact, Jesus came apart. In fact, he told his disciples, it's time to come apart before you come apart. Every now and then we need to get away from all of the madness and the rush of things and let life kind of slow down so we can focus just on God. And that's a good thing. So loneliness is not being alone or having time of solitude. While you may not be lonely when you're by yourself, you can be lonely in a crowd. You know, a person can come to a church uh, sanctuary full of people and still be lonely. You can go to a crowded mall and still be lonely. You can attend an event with thousands of people and still be lonely. In fact, sometimes a crowd may increase your sense of loneliness as you witness others enjoying the thing that you are seeking. You know, at this season, with all of the hallmark representations that we have of closeness and friendship, it seems to heighten the pain of loneliness. People see these holiday movies, and they see these families come together, this person find that perfect mate for their life, and they're feeling that emptiness in their own heart and life, and they feel very lonely during this time of the year. And, uh, you know, a person can come, I heard a church uh, growth uh, advisor, I, I hesitate to say experts, you know, people profess to be experts. You know what an expert is? An expert is a little spurt away from home. And, uh, they, I heard a guy talking one time about greeting people and said, every church I go in, they want me to come in and do it, uh, kind of a survey and see. He said, every church I go into professes to be a friendly church. We are such a friendly church. And he said, I came in, I go into those churches, and nobody greets me. Nobody shakes my hand. They're all friendly, but they're friendly with their friends. They have their circle of friends that they're friendly with. They can't wait to get to church to see their friends. But you know what? That makes a person who's new feel even more estranged because they see everybody else talking with one another and then they're not talking to them. So they feel very lonely in that situation. So I challenge you as a pastor, I'll just throw this one in here. I'll shoehorn it in, all right? Uh, when you see somebody that you don't know that's new to our congregation, go over and extend a, uh, a greeting to them. Let them know you're glad that they're here. Amen? Let them know that somebody cares that they showed up. I've been out on, on vacation and go to a church. I'm always interested to see whether or not, you know, people will be friendly or not. I've been to churches where the only guy who said hi to me or greeted me was the fellow who handed me a church bulletin at the door. And nobody else even acknowledged that I was there. And so I think that it's important for us as a church family to acknowledge those who come in. And let them know that we are glad that they're here and that they matter. Amen? So that was my mini message inside the message, okay? Okay, so loneliness is not solitude or being alone, nor is lon loneliness the same thing as being lonesome. That's caused by separation. There have been many times in my ministry where I've had to 
be away from home taking trips, and I felt lonesome because my family wasn't with me. And after about four days, it's about all I can take. I've got to come home. You know, but I start getting lonesome because I start missing the people that are near to me and dear in my life. And, uh, but the difference is, is that I'm able to adjust the temporary situation that I'm in in lonesomeness. On the other hand, loneliness is not temporary. It's ongoing. There's no end in sight for the lonely person. Loneliness is uh, not temporary, it's ongoing. What is loneliness? Loneliness is a painful sense of being unwanted, unneeded, uncared for, and maybe even unnecessary. My wife said that I went through empty nest worse than she did when the kids all left home. Different reasons, but all right around the same time. That's because... You know, prior to that, it was, Dad, I need this. Dad, the car's not running right. Dad, Dad, I need this. Dad, I need some money. Dad, I, you know, on and on it went. Then they all left, and nobody needed me but the dog. And so she said, you're closer to the dog right now. I married a very independent woman. She didn't even need me. So, But uh, at any rate, we... Uh, we need to be needed in our life. It's been observed that every person has three basic emotional needs. We need somebody to love and somebody who loves us. We need somebody who understands us. And then we also need somebody who wants and needs us. We need to be needed. We need to feel significant in somebody's life. We all have those three basic emotional needs in our life. David Jeremiah did a good job of identifying the groups of individuals that are susceptible to loneliness. He talked about the candidates of loneliness. There's the lonely single. Going home to an empty house or apartment night after night can be a desolate experience. Not everyone needs to be married. Let me say that up front. Not everybody needs to be married. You know, there's worse things than being single. Worse than being single is being married to the wrong person. So there's, there's worse things. So not everyone needs to be married, but everyone needs some friendship. They need companionship in their life. They need somebody to connect with. There's a lonely single. There's a lonely spouse. There are people in a marriage relationship that are very lonely. You know, it might surprise some of our singles to know that there are people who are married, and yet they're still lonely. Is that, guys, it might surprise you that your wife is lonely. It gutted me. One day, <laughs> when Paula said, told me we were having a conversation, and she said, well, sometimes I just feel lonely. And I thought, well, I'm here, but I'm not always here. We have so many church responsibilities going on in my mind, so many activities, so many visits to make. Sometimes it is a wonder that she doesn't feel lonely. Thank God for that strong woman that I'm married to. I'm so grateful. So I don't want her ever to feel lonely. Guys, sometimes you need to just stop and say, you know, my wife might be lonely. And you might ask her sometimes. Say, oh, preacher, don't do that. If I ask her if she's lonely or not, it's going to open up that whole can of worms about feelings and stuff. And I don't, I'm not a feely guy, and I'm not going to get in all this. That's why she's lonely. You need to spend some time talking about some of those things with her, all right? Because that's important to her. It may not be to you, but it's important to her. So we need to be careful about that. There are lonely singles. There are lonely spouses. There are lonely survivors. You know, they're in opposition to those that may be lonely in their marriage. There's the husband or wife who has to deal with the loss of a partner who has shared the joys, the burdens, and the griefs of life. Those that truly experience being one flesh have to learn to continue life without the same sense of wholeness that they had before. It's like going through life with a major amputation. You know, I, I think sometimes I see these war movies and a guy has to have his leg cut off or his arm cut off. I think what a terrible thing that would be. But you know, losing a spouse is losing a part of yourself. You become one flesh and it's, it's as though part of you is gone. And trying to learn to live with that is a, is a hard experience. Then there's the lonely senior citizen. 
number of senior citizens in our country is one of the fastest growing segments of the population. Many seniors struggle not just with being alone, but the loss of significance, the need to be needed. You kind of push the elderly to the side and say, well, you've done your time and we don't need you anymore. And more and more that becomes the, the lot of those that are get older, that technology outstrips us. You know, we, we can't work our phones. <laughs> you know, our, our recorders in our house still flash, you know, the time of the day and everything. And uh, we, we don't know how to keep up with some of that stuff. And so we feel like we've been passed by. I can say we now because I've kind of gotten up into that age group, you know. And at 68, I understand that, that feeling. I'm not as old as Brother David Buckles. But uh, God willing, one of these days I will be. So, But uh, at any rate, there's a lonely senior citizen and there's a lonely sufferer. A person going through some kind of physical problem in their life, and it seems that nobody really understands what they're going through. You know, a busy hospital can be a lonely place to a person who's ill, because a lot of people feel that they don't know what to say to the sufferer, so they avoid them. And I've, I sometimes have people come and say, you know, so-and-so is the hospital. Would you go see them, preacher? Well, I'd be glad to go see people who are in the hospital. But you know, why don't you go? I wouldn't know what to say. Sometimes it's just a ministry of presence to be there for somebody. Just show up and say, I care. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how you know, all this is working out for you, but I can pray for you. Amen? Let them know that. Now here's a, something interesting that I found. This doesn't fit into that whole alliterated list of single spouse, survivor, senior citizen, sufferer. But something interesting I found out that research has discovered that loneliness is more commonly reported among the young than the elderly. 80% of the population below 18 years of age report that they feel lonely, as opposed to 40% of the population that's above 65 years of age. That's strange. And as I read on, it was this, this was the reasoning behind it. Experience often gives us coping mechanisms as we age. As we get older, we begin to learn how to handle certain things. Children don't have that experience in their life. They don't know how to handle the loneliness that comes to them. So there are a lot of children, a lot of teenagers, a lot of young people who are lonely in this world, and they don't know how to deal with it. You know, teenage suicide rates, we say, why are they so high? Because there are a lot of lonely teenagers, a lot of kids that feel ostracized, that nobody cares about them. A lot of little kids in our world, that's important that we reach them, that we have the children's ministries that we have to show them that somebody loves them. Amen? I think that's so very, very important. Not only is loneliness a common factor in our world, it is a crippling force. It is a crippling force. It can harm you emotionally. One survey showed that 8%, 80%, excuse me, 80% of psychiatric patients sought help because of the feelings of loneliness. And counselors, of course, will tell you that loneliness is a leading cause of suicide in our world. Loneliness can lead to various psychiatric disorders, things like depression, alcohol abuse, child abuse, sleep problems, personality disorders, and Alzheimer's disease all aggravated by loneliness. It can harm you emotionally. It can hurt you physically. 50% of heart patients were lonely and depressed before they had a heart attack. ABC News reported that a nine-year study at the University of California discovered that loneliness has a greater impact on the death rate than smoking, drinking, eating, or lack of exercise. More, more um, strongly contributing to the death rate. In addition, uh, excuse me, let me back that up just a moment. The study found that people who felt isolated and alone had a death rate twice as high as those that had strong social ties. Among the lonely, the death rate was twice as high as those that had strong social ties. Now, there's another reason to be a part of a local New Testament church. Get into the church community and have strong ties, you'll live longer. All right? 
In addition, it also leads to various physical disorders, loneliness does, like diabetes, autoimmune disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, obesity, cancer, and poor hearing. Huh? All those things can be aggravated by loneliness. It can harm you emotionally, it can hurt you physically, and it can hobble you spiritually. Ironically, when people experience loneliness, many times they will drop out of church or pull away from Christian friends, the very sources they need to get strength and encouragement and get through their loneliness, to overcome it. They drop out, sit in their isolation, and drink from the intoxicating cup of self-pity and have a hangover called loneliness. You begin to suffer what someone has termed the Elijah syndrome. Elijah was that prophet who got so discouraged that he sat under a juniper tree and he said, you know, there's only I am left. There's nobody else that loves God. I'm the only one. I might as well die. And you kind of get into that frame of mind of thinking we're the only one out there and not knowing that there are others that could help us out. Thankfully, even though loneliness is a very common factor and it is a crippling force, we could take heart because loneliness is a conquered foe. There is an answer. Amen? You say, well, what is the answer to loneliness? But instead, let me tell you who the answer to loneliness is. It's Jesus. Jesus is the answer to your loneliness. In the first place, Jesus understands your loneliness. He came into this world, took on flesh so that he could understand exactly what we went through. Jesus had been rejected in his own life. He knows how you feel. Isaiah 53, verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. And we read in the New Testament, John chapter 1, verse 11, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He was rejected. He knows what loneliness is all about. We go back to our three emotional needs in life. He is someone who understands. There is somebody who understands what you're going through in life. Jesus does. He lived a life of loneliness. When he died on the cross, he was suspended between heaven and earth. My pastor I grew up under used to always use the expression, he said he was hung between heaven and earth as though rejected by both. That phrase never escaped my mind. The father couldn't look on the sin and the world rejected him. His own friends deserted him while he was on the cross. Because he had taken the sins of the world upon himself, even God the Father in holy righteousness could not look upon him. At that moment, even his disciples forsook him. Jesus died alone. He knew what true loneliness was. Not only does Jesus understand your loneliness, you need to understand that you are precious to him. He loves you. There's somebody to love us. There's somebody who understands us, and there's somebody to, who loves us. The Son of God loves us. Had there not been one more soul on earth, even one other soul, I believe, and I don't know that I have a scripture to back this up, but I believe it with my heart, Jesus would have died just for you. He loves you so much. His death on the cross was so personal that he would have died just for you. Jesus loves you, and you're precious to him. The Bible says he knows the very hairs of your head. That's getting easier and easier every day morning at my house for him to know that, all right? He wants you, to. he knows you, and he cares about you. He understands you. And lastly, let me say this, he's always there. He is always there. You may be feeling lonely, but you're never in fact alone. He's promised over in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, that he will never leave us or forsake us. I have quoted that scripture numerous times at funeral homes and hospital rooms and told people, the Lord has promised he will never leave us or forsake us. He is here. That's the fact. Amen? That is the fact. God doesn't, you know, we need somebody who understands us. We need somebody who loves us. And we need to feel needed. Well, God doesn't really need you, does he? 
No, technically, no. God, God is all self-sufficient. He doesn't actually need anyone. He's just, he is the man that I am. So he really doesn't need us. But he has included us in his plans. He has chosen to use us to reach out for him. We become his hands, his feet, his eyes, his voice. God could deliver this message without me. I'm a very poor substitute to speak for God this morning, but I have the privilege of standing here and speaking his word and, and being able to deliver his word. That's a great privilege that I have, an awesome responsibility. But God has chosen to use me in that in that in this capacity. So in a sense, he needs me. He needs me to be faithful to deliver his word. He needs you to share his love with a world that doesn't know him. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because Jesus went back to the Father. And he's left us to carry that on. As Luke said in the beginning of the book of Acts, he said, this is a record of all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. All these works of the early church. Jesus began to do all this, and he went back to the Father, and he left that job and that task for his followers to carry out. We are needed. We are needed in this world because this world doesn't know him. We're needed in this world because we are God's chosen vessels to share his love to this world. So we are needed. And before I conclude this thought about our conquered foe, I need to make this one very important distinction. Please pay attention to this. Loneliness is a feeling. Loneliness is a feeling. Being alone is a fact. And why is, is that an important distinction? As a child of God, we should not be controlled by our feelings, but rather bring them into submission to God's fact. God's facts. The feeling, the feeling is I'm all alone in this world or situation that I'm in, and there's nobody who cares, understands, or will help me. But the fact is, the fact is, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. I will not leave you, as he told in, in John chapter 16, I will not leave you comfortless. And literally, that means I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus said, I'm not abandoning you in this world. He saved us and he doesn't abandon us. What a terrible thing it would be for a, for a father to bring his newborn child home from the hospital and leave it in a room and then go off somewhere, take a long trip and leave that baby abandoned in some room in a house, an empty house. You say, that, that man would be terrible. And sometimes we feel that way about God. We birth, God birthed us into this world, spiritually into his family and that he's abandoned us. But he's promised he will not leave us or abandon us in this world. He is with us, amen? And he is going to be with you. I want to look at an event of the life of Jesus that illustrates the difference between the fact and the feeling. If you will, turn, if you're in Luke still, where we opened up, turn over a couple of chapters, go to the right, a couple of chapters to, to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse, first verse. We read there, it says, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. We find that Jesus was in a lonely wilderness. When it says wilderness, we tend to think about our own country and the frontier and Daniel Boone and the wilderness being all these forests. The wilderness in Jesus' uh, time, in his area, was desert. It was barren wasteland. That was the wilderness. He was in a barren place, a lonely place. And I might add that it was by God's direction. It says that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was there under God's direction. God knew where he was. You know, God knows where you are. You may think you're hiding, but you're not. God knows just where you are. But we can see that he was, even though he was in a lonely place, he was not alone. He was full of the Spirit. It 
Satan wanted to take advantage of the loneliness of the situation to tempt Jesus. He wanted to tempt Jesus to scrap the Father's plan and listen to his alternative. You know, the devil comes along to us and he tries to convince us that God is, is cruel, that we're in a place and God has brought us this place and God is unfair. He wants to slander God and have us think things of God that are not worthy of God. And so the devil was trying to tempt Jesus during this time. And there are three lessons that we can draw from these verses that will help us trump our feelings with the facts. First of all, we must rely on the one who is with us rather than regret those who are not. We have to learn to focus on the one who is with us rather than those who are not. Jesus is with us and he's enough. I have Jesus, and that's really all I need in this life. You know, he has been through the most severe trials. He is sufficient for any trial I'm going through. He knows what I'm experiencing, and he is enough. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That's God's promise. Amen? That's a fact. The other is feeling. I'm all alone in this. I don't have any way to cope with this. God says, no, I'm with you, and I will give you strength. So one is a feeling. The other is a fact. Then secondly, after we understand we must rely on the one who is with us, we need to realize that there are some aspects of loneliness and trial that only you and God can understand. There are some things you're going through that nobody else will really understand. And you need to be okay with that. You know, the Bible tells us here in this passage that Jesus was tempted 40 days. Verse 2 says, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Do you realize that of those 40 days, the only thing we have recorded are these last three temptations? We don't know what else went into those 40 days of temptation. It was something that was between the Father and the Son, something that he was experiencing in that temptation in the wilderness, that we don't have any idea what he was going through. There are some things that God is taking you through that he will be with you, and only you and God will understand that. Don't be disappointed when somebody else doesn't understand what you're going through. Some things you can't, they can't understand. It's a private time between you and the Father. He wants to draw you close to Him. I've gone through some stuff, and I think, I don't know why I'm going through this. The only course I have is to draw close to Him. And in those times, God communes with my spirit and ministers to my heart, and it's in those times that I feel closest to Him during those times that God wants to draw close to me. I can't find somebody else. I can't call up one of my preacher buddies. I can't call up a church member and say, I'm going through this. How do I get through this? Because either they won't understand or whatever, but God always knows what I'm going through. And there's some things that I can only take to him and spend time in his presence. And the third thing is you can rejoice in the usefulness that God develops in his servants through the lonely times. God uses the lonely times in our life to prepare us for deeper service in our life. Jesus emerged from the wilderness to start his public ministry. The, the adults here in the auditorium are studying the life of Joseph on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. We've learned about Joseph being in a very lonely place, thrown into a pit and transferred to a prison. And finally, he finds himself in the palace. But God was using the lonely times of his life to prepare him for greater public ministry in times when, uh, when God would uh, use him to be a blessing. Andrew Murray was a pastor and a very godly man of prayer. He knew what it was like, he knew what it was like to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit when in difficult, trying settings and feeling like he was all alone. He went through some very tough times in his life. But he wrote this, and I love this, so listen to what he wrote. God brought me here, this difficult place. And maybe you can identify this. Maybe you're in a season of illness in your life. Maybe you're going through a 
personal relationship struggle. Maybe you're going through some problem in your life. Whatever that problem is, you feel so isolated by. Think about that for just a moment and, and apply these words. God brought me here. It is by his will I am here. I will rest in this. He will keep me here in his love. He will give me the grace to behave as his child. He will make the trial a blessing, teaching me the lesson he intends for me to learn. In his good time, he will bring me out again, how and when he knows. So let me say this. He summarizes this, this statement in four, four, four very powerful statements. I am here by God's appointment. I'm here by God's appointment. I am in his, I'm here in his keeping. He's watching over me. I am here under his training. I am here for his time. You know, no matter what you're going through, you can apply those four principles. I'm here by God's appointment. God knows right where I am, and he has an appointment for me in this. I'm here in his keeping. He's not taken his hands off me. He's not abandoned me in this time. I'm here under his training. He's got something he wants me to learn. I've said this so many times, and somebody repeated it back to me a couple of weeks ago. I thought, hey, they were listening. Um, but I've, I've often said this. If you're going to go through a time of suffering, don't waste it. Don't go through it and then not learn anything from it. I need to learn what God is teaching me in this time. And I am here for his time. He will bring me out again. When, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, because God's, God's timing is different than mine. I have a friend that says, you know the thing that bothers me about God? Is he said, God acts like he has all the time in the world. And you know he does, amen? He makes everything beautiful in his time. He's not quite finished working on me yet, so there's something else for me to learn during this time. So... Just be patient during this time. Undoubtedly, Christian, there have been, there have been, there are right now currently, and there will yet be in the future times when we feel lonely, but when we can rest confidently in the fact that he will never leave us or forsake us. I want to uh, put a timely appeal on our prayer time, our invitation prayer time. You know, we live in a world full of lonely people. Can you understand that? If you are not feeling lonely right now, there is somebody that you know who is lonely. And that may not be wearing a sign around their neck that says, I'm lonely, but they are, in fact, lonely. Do you know someone who's struggling with loneliness during this difficult time? What could God do through you to make a difference in their life this week? Could it be as simple as a phone call? As I said, that anonymous older man who said, you know, Christmas guts me because I've already come to accept the fact that there won't even be a single phone call. For some people, a phone call could make all the difference for them. It could be as simple as a phone call, maybe run an errand, or leave an anonymous treat on somebody's desk. Find somebody who's hurting and just leave something that says, a little note that says, I'm thinking about you, and leave a little present on their desk for them. That could make a difference for a person's whole week, their whole month, maybe their whole Christmas season. Maybe the devil would like us to feel, to use feelings of loneliness and be discouraged by them. Why don't you seek to be proactive and look for someone to whom you can show yourself to be friendly? The Bible says if a man would have friends, he must show his friends, he must show himself to be friendly, amen? And rather than let self-pity rob you of the joy you can have in serving, let me repeat to you this morning, most important point, the ultimate answer to loneliness is a personal and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're watching this message at home, we have people that are tuned in on Facebook, and you recognize that you have an emptiness in your life that only Christ can fill, I want you to know that he is only a prayer away. He's just a prayer away for you. 
if you will just talk to him and ask him to forgive you your sins, he will come into your life today. I want you to feel free to call our office or contact us through our website at Bible BAP, that's B-I-B-L-E-B-A-P-P dot com. And we will be glad to talk to you and share God's wonderful promises with your life. That should probably be on your screen. I don't know if it's on the screen behind me right now. And uh, if you need further help at any time, feel free to give us a call. Or grab me here. If you're here, certainly grab me. and We'll have a word of prayer here in this uh, holy place together. Amen. I want you to stand, if you will.